Gospel of John, chapter 7. If you will turn there, we'll pick up our study of John where we left off. Since we left off with chapter 6, we might as well just go right next door to chapter 7. Verses 1 and 2. After these things, Jesus walked in Galilee, for he did not want to walk in Judea because the Jews sought to kill him. Now the Jews' feast of tabernacles was at hand. His brothers therefore said to him, Depart from here and go into Judea that your disciples also may see the works that you are doing. For no one does in secret while he himself seeks to be known openly. If you do these things, show yourself to the world. Show yourself to the world. The Feast of Tabernacles is the last of the seven feasts of the Lord on the Jewish calendar. Precedes it is the Day of Atonement, and trumpets. Trumpets, Day of Atonement, Tabernacles. This year, Feast of Tabernacles will be celebrated in the middle of October. So this would put this event in the fall. Now, the Feast of Tabernacles was a required feast set by God through Moses. It appears in several of the Old Testament writings. Each adult male was obliged to go and celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles. It was understood that it would be the third of the feasts that every male was required to travel to Jerusalem. I did a cursory look through the Old Testament and I could not find a caveat where the Lord God said, well, if you don't want to go, you don't have to go. But rather, it is required to go. There are two other feasts that had a similar requirement. Unleavened bread, which included Passover and Pentecost. Three times a year, God wanted his men over the age of 25 to bring an offering to him to show their worship, their dedication to who he is. Now, perhaps Jesus had a good reason. He did not want to go because the Jews sought to kill him. As we read on, we'll see that there's some other circumstances included in the description. Now he ends up going, but in the middle of the feast, he arrives in Jerusalem, which in itself tells us that his appearance was not remarkable. He is missed because he isn't with his apostles When the feast starts, they're there and they're questioned about where is he? Then he arrives later in the middle and that's probably significant and he begins immediately teaching. But let's continue reading. Verse six, then Jesus said to them, my time has not yet come, but your time is already. The world cannot hate you, but it hates me. Because I testify of it and its works are evil. You go up to the feast. I am not yet going up to this feast for my time has not yet fully come. When he said these things to them, he remained in Galilee. My time has not yet come. Indicating of the threat 
I suppose, the threat that the Jews would violate one of the commandments of God, which he's going to talk to them about in just a moment, and take him by force and murder him. And it wasn't time for him to be crucified yet. In fact, it's the wrong feast. According to scripture, it's prophesied that the Lamb of God would be crucified during Passover, which will happen until we get to chapter 12 of the Gospel of John. So in that regard, he's absolutely correct. His time has not yet come. Another way of looking at the same phrase is, I'm coming later. My time to go has not come. Unless he lied, and I don't see my Lord lying, not telling the truth. Or he changed his mind. Can God change his mind? I suppose so. Maybe. He changes not, right? Don't we sing that here? No shadow of turning. So take it how you wish. The scripture says, my time has not yet come. You go ahead and go. The men are going through the book of Zechariah and being... <laughs> who we are, we decided to read the end of the book and then go back and start the beginning of the book. We want to know how it ends. Not that you've ever done that, but <laughs> in the last chapter, Zechariah speaks of a time when the Feast of Tabernacles will be a required visit to Jerusalem. Chapter 14, verse 16 reads, quote, and it shall come to pass that everyone who is left of all the nations which came against Jerusalem shall go up from year to year to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, and to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. Now, if you go there and read it later on today, or you can read it right now while I'm talking, your choice Zechariah goes on to say that in the spirit of the Lord that those who refuse to come, those nations that re refuse to attend will suffer drought, consequences of their not coming. So God changes a little bit with a punishment in the last days of those nations who are left, of those who came against Jerusalem. So having read that a week or so ago, now we're going through Zechariah line by line from chapter 1 to see exactly how we should interpret that, which is just another way of studying the book. Hold your place in John 7, where we left off reading, and go to verse 4. 37, because I want to point out something so when we get to it, it will stand out as remarkable as it did when I read it. John 7, verse 37, quote, On the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out, saying, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Now, we have a glimpse in why Jesus waited till the middle of the feast, because he wanted to emphasize the eighth day. If you go back to Leviticus and Deuteronomy, where the commandment of the Feast of Tabernacles is described, it's a seven-day feast with an eighth day, a day of celebration, a day of joy. In fact, over the years, it became known as Shemkat Torah, a day to celebrate the Torah. I've been told, I've never seen it, that on this eighth day, they would get a scroll from the Torah and they would dance. 
singing praises to God for his word. Can you imagine going downtown Chino Valley with a Bible and <laughs> dancing around? What's this all about? We just like the word of God. And, oh, now that you've asked, let me show you something. But this is what they did on the eighth day. And Jesus takes advantage of that day, that special celebration, to announce again that he's living water. So we can add this to the list of his radicalness that we started last week. Now he's saying, I'm, I'm living water. You drink from me and out of you will flow rivers of living water. Well, we'll have to figure out what he meant by that as we proceed through here. So Jesus is talking about this eighth day feast and he is saying to the people in his hearing, take advantage of what's happening here. Take full advantage of this eighth day that God prescribed years, decades, centuries ago and realize exactly what is happening he is the fulfillment of this special eighth day. Picking up where we left off as John goes through. Verse 10. But when his brothers had gone up, then he also went up to the feast, not openly, but as it were in secret. The Jews sought him at the feast and said, where is he? And there was much complaining among the people concerning him. Some said, he's good. Others said, no. On the contrary, he deceives the people. However, no one spoke openly of him for the fear of the Jews. Now I need to pause for a second. It seems to me that John is using the phrase the Jews to specifically identify a small group within the Jewish people, perhaps the leadership, the Pharisees and the scribes, etc. Because I don't think the whole Jewish nation is arguing. They may be confused, they may be either for or against, but I don't think they're in Jerusalem divided but maybe they are let's keep reading because it's going to say he causes division among the people now about the middle of the feast jesus went up into the temple and taught and the jews marveled saying how does this man know letters having never studied. <laughs> now we chuckle because we know he's the author of the letters of the Bible. He's the inspiration for even what John is writing here. But they're thinking of him as a Galilean, an uneducated person. Who is this guy? Who taught him? You know, we're well educated. See, you can tell I'm well-educated by the way I dress. But he just dressed like an ordinary person, like you, sitting there. An ordinary dude just coming up to celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles, and he has the audacity to stand up and teach them, not in the marketplace, in the temple. There he is teaching this unlearned Galilean, as it were. Verse 16, and Jesus said, my doctrine is not mine, but his who sent me. Now, if you look up the word doctrine, it can also be translated teaching. Let's read it that way. My teaching is not mine, but his who sent me. He's going back to what he said earlier. I did not come on my own. 
I say the words that the Father gave me. But he reduces the Father, that's the wrong phrase, he personalizes the Father as he. He who sent me, these are his teachings, his doctrine. Verse 7, if anyone wills to do his will, he should know concerning the doctrine, whether it is from God or whether I speak on my own authority. If you remember last week, what is the will of the Father? That everyone would believe on him. So he is putting that out there again at this Feast of Tabernacles. Verse 18, he who speaks from himself speaks on his own glory, but he who seeks the glory of the one who sent him is true, and no unrighteousness is in him. Now that is a bold statement. And then he challenges their heart and their motives. Verse 19. Did not Moses give you the law? Yet none of you keeps the law. Why do you seek to kill me? Had they had gone through their plan, they would have been guilty of the commandment, thou shalt not kill. And what they were planning to do would be premeditated murder. They were making plans to kill him, to destroy him, because they saw him as a threat, as a blasphemer, and they wanted done with him. They will eventually pull it off, but his time is not yet. So they'll have to wait until his time arrives. Verse 20, the people answered and said, you have a demon. Who's seeking to kill you? Now, I don't know if you've ever been accused of having a demon when you talked about Jesus, but I know with almost certainty, the some to whom you've been sharing the gospel with will look at you like, are, are, are you serious? Are you from this planet? Well, yeah, no. <laughs> and Jesus said, I did one work and you all marvel." One work? Well, if you were to single out all the healings as a single work, he did the same work multiple times. I did a, one thing to draw your attention to him who sent me, and you're conjuring up all of this evil. Verse 22, Moses therefore gave you circumcision, not that it is from Moses, but from the fathers, and you circumcise a man on the Sabbath, if a man receives circumcision on the Sabbath so that the law of Moses should not be broken, are you angry with me because I made a man completely well on the Sabbath? Do not judge according to appearance, but judge with righteous judgment. Now there's something to put on the back of your shirt, Bob. Do not judge by appearance, but with righteousness. And this is what God wants you to do, to judge righteously, not to condemn, but to love. And he is looking, I think, right at these men who are plotting to kill him and saying, look, you're planning to violate the law of God through Moses when you yourselves are somewhat guilty of violating the same law. If you go through the New Testament, you will find that Jesus often, very often, challenged the leadership 
of Israel with regard to their application of the law. I think, my opinion, this is why he did so many of his miracles on the Sabbath. Because they were being hypocritical about the Sabbath, and we're going to see an example of that in just a few more lines of Scripture. So I think he was put out with them because they had a double standard. They would do what they wanted on the Sabbath, and they would justify it by their interpretation of the Sabbath according to what they wanted it to mean, but then they would judge others more harshly about the Sabbath. A lot of his confrontation with this leadership was over this single command. Thou shalt keep the Sabbath holy. Which is clearly in the scriptures. It's right up at the top of the list with regard to the things that they were to do. They, and you know this because you've studied it before, were so concerned about not violating the Sabbath and keeping it holy, they built a whole set of rules around the single command. This is why they got upset with the man who was carrying his bed, even though he was commanded to carry his bed by Jesus, who's the Lord of the Sabbath. So to keep people from violating the Sabbath and to not do any ordinary work on it, they had all of these regulations on what you could and could not do on the Sabbath. Some of them were quite astounding, if you will. For example, ladies, if you're in the habit of carrying a safety pin in your apron, Oh, wait a minute. Maybe your grandmother did that. Maybe you don't. Remember Granny always had a safety pin for an emergency in her? Well, if she did that on the Sabbath, she'd be violating the Sabbath according to their law. She was carrying something that she would possibly maybe use in an emergency, another violation of the Sabbath. So that safety pin was against the law. So you wouldn't violate the law and break the commandment. And they had a bunch of them. And one of them was how far you could walk on the Sabbath. A Sabbath day journey is in the Gospels. So they came up with a distance that an Orthodox person could walk, could travel on the Sabbath day and no further. And then they devised a way to get around it. I'm not making this up. It's in the history books. So let's say from here to the end of the podium is the Sabbath day journey. So the day before, what I would do is I would go over to the end of the trail and I would put a sack lunch. And then the next day, I'd return, oh. And in pausing and eating, I just added another journey, distance. And if I did that three times, I could arrive from my destination and never break the law. If your kids try to do that, and they have, haven't they? Clean up your room and don't put everything under the bed. <laughs> and so they had all of these good intentions, but ridiculous. So this is what Jesus, I think, is confronting, attacking, if you will, when he is talking to them. Verse 25. Now, some of them from Jerusalem said, is this not he whom they seek to kill? But look, he speaks boldly, and they say nothing to him. Do the rulers know indeed that he is truly the Christ? However, 
We know there is a man where this man is from. But when the Christ comes, no one knows where he is from. And Jesus cried out as he taught the temple, you both know me and you know where I am from. And I have not come from myself, but he who sent me is true, whom you do not know. But I know him, for I am from him, and he sent me. Jesus is confronting them on what they should have known from studying the scriptures. They should have known him as Messiah because he performed the miracles up the Messiah would do. Every one of them. And the Messiah was from the Father. So they should have put it together. But they haven't. Because they haven't really studied the scriptures without prejudice. Which is sometimes difficult to do. Amen? Sometimes it's difficult to read a passage in the Bible without all of our preconceived notions of what it already means and just let it speak to us. But this is what he is saying. Verse 30. Therefore they sought to take him, but no one laid a hand on him, because his hour had not yet come. And many of the people believed in him. When the Christ comes, he will do more signs than those which this man has done. Because he's not done yet. Verse 32. The Pharisees heard the crowd murmuring these things concerning him, and the Pharisees... And the chief priests and officers to take him. Then Jesus said to them, I shall be with you a little while longer, and then I go to him who sent me. You will seek me and not find me. And where I am, you cannot come. <laughs> I love my Lord. They're coming to arrest him. And he says to them, I'm going away, and where I'm going, you can't follow. <laughs> Look at their reaction. So you know where he's going and you're going to go with him because you're a believer and you can follow where he's going. But they're unbelievers so they can't go. But they haven't figured that out yet. But this he spoke excuse me. And then the Jews said among themselves where does he intend to go that we shall not find him? Does he intend to go to the dispersed Dispersion among the Greeks and teach the Greeks? What is this thing that he said, you will seek me and not find me? And where I am, you cannot come. See, they were students of the Bible, scriptures, but not learners. They were reading and misinterpreting. They were reading to justify their own religious status, not for a transformation that the Bible brings. We shall not be guilty of that. We shall read the Bible for its intended purpose, and that is to make us what? Servants of the Lord. On the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out, saying, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me and has the scripture is set out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. But this he spoke concerning the Spirit, whom those believing in him would receive, for the Holy Spirit has, was not yet given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. Thank you, John, for explaining what is going on. So now we know the living water of which Jesus spoke is the Spirit of God, which he gives freely to those who come to him. It's not H2O. It is the Spirit of the living God indwelling in, transforming those who believe which includes you, I hope. Therefore, many from the crowd, when they heard this saying, said, truly, this is a prophet. Others said, this is the Christ. But some said, will the Christ come out of Galilee? 
Has not the scripture said that the Christ comes from the seed of David and from the town of Bethlehem, where David was? Obviously, they didn't know where he was born, right? Clearly, they refused to understand anything about this man because they rejected him for whatever reason. Prejudice? I don't know. Ignorance, perhaps. He cannot be the Christ because he's from Galilee. Nothing comes out of Galilee. In fact, they will almost say that. So there was a division among the people because of him. Yes. Now, some of them wanted to take him, but no one laid hands on him. Then the officers came to the chief priests and the Pharisees and said to them, why have you not brought him? And the officers said, no man ever spoke like this man. Can you imagine being sent with the authority of the Sanhedrin to collect this guy? And you go up and you're going... I'm not grabbing him. <laughs> Nobody ever spoke. And see, that's what you saw. That's who you saw when you read Jesus clearly out of the Bible. This is why you gave your heart to him and trusted him because you saw him for who he is. Not for who the world thought he was, but who he is. And you bowed down and you worshipped him and you gave him your heart and your soul and you followed him and he granted you living water, his spirit forever. Verse 45. Then the Pharisees said to them, verse 47, are you deceived have any of the rulers of the Pharisees believed in him? Well, yes, but they don't know it yet. But this crowd that does not know the law is accursed. They just gave away the secret of their hypocrisy, the depth that they would sink. I want to read that again and remember who is saying this. Religious leaders of the day of Jesus who purported themselves to be lawyers, knowledgeable of the law of God, interpreters and enforcers of the law of God. I lost my spot again. <laughs> Accursed. I apologize. Verse 49, thank you. But this crowd that does not know the law is accursed. That's how they thought of the general population. Accursed. Because they don't understand the law like we do. Therefore, they'll follow anybody, anywhere, anytime, because they're not easily deceived, accursed. Verse 50. But this crowd that does not know the whole, Nicodemus, who came to Jesus by night, being one of them, said to them, see, Nicodemus is a believer and he's a Pharisee. Does our law judge a man before he hears him and knows what he is doing? And they answered and said to him, are you also from Galilee? Search and look, for no prophet has arisen out of Galilee. Are they right? They're wrong. Two prophets are from the north, Jonah and Elisha. So being those who claim to know the scripture don't know the scriptures at all. Because they ignore, maybe they just ignored the truth to make their point. 
Nah, they wouldn't do anything like that. <laughs> the one thing I want you to walk out of here with this morning is that Jesus announced on the eighth day a day of celebration and joy that he is living water. And that anybody and everybody who comes to him, he will give the Holy Spirit of God who is living water. And the Holy Spirit of God will flow through that person like a river of living water. You are a walking source of blessing to everybody you come in contact with. Everybody who meets you, everybody who sees you, everybody who listens to you, everybody that you greet, even the server at the restaurant you may go to this afternoon, you are a walking, living, breathing blessing. An ambassador of Jesus Christ himself. Do it well. Be a real blessing. Just exemplify. Just let the Spirit of God flow through you. See, Jesus was fulfilling, and they would not recognize it, what the prophet Isaiah would say. Quote from Isaiah 44, verse 3. For I will pour water on him who is thirsty and floods on the dry ground. I will pour my spirit on your descendants and my blessing on your offspring. See, had they really known the scriptures, they would have known what he was saying. That the water that he was offering was in fact the spirit of the most holy God. I want you to be so knowledgeable of the word of God that the word of God flows through you. Not so much that you can quote any verse anytime, anywhere with its proper address and pronunciation, but the word of God, Jesus himself just exudes from you. Wherever you are, whatever you're doing, you are doing as a restored new creation acting like the person you are, the very image of Christ and your creator who created you in his image, which sin damaged and Jesus corrected that's who you are. You are a new creation, heaven bound, with no limitations. Because as the psalmist said, he goes before you. The pit they have dug for you, they will fall into themselves. Go.